Okay. So good afternoon, everybody. I'm so glad that you are here. My name is Mona Raglow. I'm the Director of Member Experience at Central Exchange. And I'm really excited about today's workshop. Uh, Mindy and Lisa have presented at Central Exchange before, and I was so thrilled when they agreed to come back and uh, do an encore performance. So just a quick introduction about their company. Life disruptions happen to everyone, and then we go back to work. And I think many of us are living through that right now. Workplace Healing LLC offers an innovative approach to healing in the workplace after an employee experiences grief, trauma, or life disruption. Co-founders Lisa Cooper and Mindy Corcoran share an overview of their HOPE workshop training designed to close the gap on presenteeism, lower costs associated with bereavement, and provide needed tools for managers, directors, and leaders in interacting with an employee whose personal life has been affected by life disruption. Unfortunately, I think we have all been impacted this, so we're very anxious to, to learn from both of you. Uh, just a couple of tips for everybody. Uh, we do ask that you keep your mics muted. There will be maybe some time that we have an opportunity to ask questions. And I encourage everybody to open their chat window because we will be participating via chat. So with that in mind, uh, Mindy and Lisa, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Mona. Thank you for that introduction and uh, a little bit of the rules on engagement for Zoom as well. Uh, I am Mindy Corcoran. I'm one of the co-founders of Workplace Healing. And you are going to be listening to us provide an overview of what we offer and call our HOPE workshop. Today in corporate America, the total cost of employee <coughs> grief is $100 billion. That's a big number, $100 billion. We recognize that employers can innovatively help with this problem. They can innovatively be part of the solution. Please meet my business partner and co-founder of Workplace Healing, Lisa Cooper. Thank you, Mindy. Again, I'm Lisa Cooper, co-founder of Workplace Healing. You know, when we talk about that number, $100 billion in the cost of grief, we also got to take a look at the, the notion of being absent and present in the workplace. And that's another really important point we want to make, because when we talk about productivity in the workplace, there's a relatively new term out called presenteeism. And... The notion of presenteeism is that it can cut productivity by one third or more. We're actually, as you'll see on your screen right now, we're gonna do a poll in terms of if you've heard of the term presenteeism. Because right now it's a relatively new term and there's actually been a lot of studies in the UK on presenteeism and its effect on workplace productivity, but not as much in the United States. But we like to call it for our, for our purposes today, present, not present. So it looks like right now, it's about 60-40 in terms of those of you, yes, who have heard of presenteeism, and then about 40% no. So that'll help us today. So when we talk about workplace healing, the foundation of workplace healing is the balance of head and heart in the workplace. And we believe that at Workplace Healing, we can work to help companies find that delicate balance and cut down on presenteeism and cut down on those dollars on grief. When we look at the head and heart in the workplace, I also like to equate it to left brain, right brain. And if we spend all our time on the left brain side, we might be meeting a ton of deadlines and we might be talking about a very linear approach to work, but we're not talking about the emotive side of humans. And if we're too much on the right side with the heart side, we're um, perhaps not meeting deadlines and not getting work done. So for each company that we work with, when we talk about the cost of grief and the cost of presenteeism at work, we've got to help them find that balance and what's going to work for them. And we believe that when we can find that balance of head and heart in the workplace, we're going to be able to lower product or lower presenteeism and boost productivity, productivity in the workplace. One of the things that we talk about with the balance of head and heart it's also a culture shift. It's a culture shift for corporate America. So the tools that we're gonna be talking about today, and as Mindy mentioned, we're gonna give you our typical HOPE workshop is about a 90 minute workshop. We're gonna be giving you the 45 minute overview today on some of those tools and some of those techniques that we use to teach CEOs, leaders, managers on how to balance head and heart at work. So life disruptions, we talked about life disruptions early on in the introduction. They are actually the cause of grief and trauma 
And there are the things that truly affect being present in the workplace. So Mindy's gonna dive a little bit deeper into life disruptions and exactly some of the things we're talking about. Mindy? Thank you, Lisa. My personal life disruption happened in 2014. I know that we're all right now in the life disruption of COVID-19, which actually makes our presentation a little bit easier to offer. When we uh, started speaking publicly uh, about our HOPE workshop in 2019, the explanation I'm going to give you <clears throat> was a little bit more necessary, but because we're in COVID-19, it's not as necessary. So uh, I'll just repeat, in April 2014, I had a significant life disruption. My father and son were both murdered. They were murdered and that totally rocked my world. Most people are not going to experience a life disruption similar to what I experienced, which I'm thankful for. But we all experience life disruption. So as we go forward uh, in our presentation, we're going to be talking about life disruptions and we use that word often. And I want to just make sure everyone is aware that we're not talking about the type of life disruption that I had, although those do happen. But we're talking about what is more common. Um, divorce, unfortunately, is very common. Perhaps um, cancer treatments, someone going through ongoing treatments. So sometimes a life disruption is not just one thing that happens or takes you out for one week or maybe two weeks, but a life disruption can happen where it's over a long period of time. So, so be thinking um, about any kind of life disruption that you have had in the past. Perhaps uh, you have had one or more of your parents pass away. It's likely that you have had a grandparent pass away and perhaps they were very close to you or helped raise you. That could be a significant life disruption. The importance of understanding that we are talking about all life disruptions is because when life disruptions happen that are significant to us, we end up having what is called a foggy brain. And when we have a foggy brain, it, it, we find it difficult then to re-engage back at work. So in our introduction, we said, life disruptions happen and then we get back to work. And we're gonna help you get back to work on that. Our typical way of managing life disruptions is with um, some standard operating procedures. And a standard operating procedure would go something like this. So as an employer, uh, my employee is coming back and they've had a life disruption. And let's say, uh, let's say it's a divorce. It's, let's use divorce as an example right now. So they come back to, into the office and I know that the divorce is not something that just happens in one day. If you've been divorced, it can be a process. If you've not been divorced, I'm telling you, it can be a process. And so they're, they're coming into the office and I'm noticing that they're disrupted and they're, they might not be um, handling things as well in the office. And I tend to want to help them. And some of the things that I might do are hand them a card to go to the EAP, which is the Employee Assistance uh, Provider which can be very helpful. EAPs op often offer just a variety of services. The problem with this is that EAPs are underutilized. And as an employer or manager, CEO, leader of a company, what you've done is you've handed your employee a card or a number and you've said, why don't you check in with them? But you've now detached yourself from that employee. And we want you to re-engage. We want um, our employers that we're talking to to become the lifeline or the umbilical cord to that employee and not just send them off. That doesn't mean that an EAP isn't useful. It just means that there needs to be more reintegration. And so that's what we're talking about in workplace healing is more uh, reintegration. And so we'll walk through that scenario of how you can be that person. You can be that um, employer leader in your community, leader in your workplace. Because when we have return of human capital, when, when humans can return uh, and have a soft landing, then we're going to get return on investment. So again, without return of human capital, we don't have great return on investment. That takes us into the HOPE Workshop. Lisa. Thank you. So the HOPE Workshop, when we actually are doing our HOPE Workshop for Corporate America, we have developed our 90-minute HOPE Workshop, but we have four training modules. And as Mindy mentioned, we like to call ourselves the, the line, the life link, the umbilical cord, between that employee who's been disrupted and the EAP because we're talking to the team and we're talking about training teams and training leaders. So the four modules that we're talking to these leaders and CEOs and managers about, number one, H stands for heart-based healing. And we're gonna talk about what is it, how do you recognize it, and how do you talk about it? 
The second module of training is called Opportunities for Healing. And this is so very important because it's so often people do not know what to say and how to respond and how to interact when someone comes back to work after they've been affected by a life disruption. So that's called Opportunities for Healing. Third, we talk about purpose. And we wanna make sure that leaders understand that when someone has experienced a life disruption, whatever that may be, sometimes purpose and meaning are even more important in their life and it's gotta be more important at work. And then we talk about employee, employer engagement. And that is again, the practical tools that we can help a team articulate exactly what to do when someone is coming to work after a life disruption. So the first H we talk about is heart-based healing. And that's what I call the emotive side of the communication. I love a linear diagram because I think it helps explain everything. And heart-based healing consists of really two key components, whole self-awareness and whole self-awareness leads to empathy. We can never be an empathetic leader without inner and outer awareness. And one of the things we've um, discovered that in so often in our lives, we're lacking that inner awareness. One of my favorite examples is how often have we ever driven to work and forgotten how we got there? And that is actually a perfect example of lack of self-awareness. And we actually, you'll see on your screen now, just a um, quick poll to see if you've ever experienced that. So yeah, 100% of us, and I would say no judgment, no criticism, because certainly we've all done it. But that's a, that's a great example of lack of self-awareness. We're not endangering anybody, but it's a lack of self-awareness. So when we talk about whole self-awareness, as leaders, we must recognize that we cannot leave grief at the door. We can't leave a life disruption at the door. So when that person comes to work, we need to recognize their whole self, their whole human self. And in our full workshops, we talk a little bit about the work of Peter Drucker, who you may recognize as an expert in organizational management. And Peter Drucker often said that you can't hire a hand, the whole man, or in our case, the whole woman, comes with it. So you can't hire a hand. We've got to hire the whole, whole person. So when we think about heart-based healing, whole self-awareness consists of inner and outer. And in our full workshops, we do a lot of interactive exercises on how to really boost that inner and outer awareness muscle so that you too can understand, um, number one, recognize the feelings within yourself, and two, recognizing others better, which leads us to empathy. So as we talk about empathy, we talk about putting ourselves in the shoes of another or appreciating the feelings of another, feeling with people. And we also have another poll question now, just to get a feel for if you believe that you work for an empathetic employer, and you'll see the range of, of, of answers for you to answer here. But as far as empathy goes, it's important to understand that we can, there's a distinct understanding between empathy and sympathy. And we like to articulate this as sympathy is feeling sorry for someone, uh, feeling pity for somebody. But empathy is actually putting yourself in their shoes, as I mentioned, and the only way to get to empathy is to feel within ourselves. So we actually uh, truly appreciate the work that Brene Brown does in terms of empathy. And we're gonna go ahead and take a listen at a short video now where she articulates very clearly, again, the differences between empathy and sympathy. Go ahead and take a listen. So what is empathy and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole 
and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, and climb down. I know what it's like down here and you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, <laughs> it's bad, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, no, you want a sandwich? <laughs> um, Empathy is a choice and it's a vulnerable choice because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. At least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. (laughs) John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now, I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. So as leaders, how can we find that connection with our team? And you know, I read an interesting just article this morning that we talk so much about, oh, we're working from home, we're working from home. But the quote that I just read that I loved is you're not working from home, you're at your home during a crisis trying to work. And I think that's really important too as we talk about COVID-19 because as leaders, we really have to amp up empathy because there are so many situations going on right now when people are trying to work more efficiently from home that we even have to have to work harder as leaders at being empathy and again just taking a step back it begins with inner awareness so when you look at the numbers and these of course were were pre-covid pre-global pandemic numbers but last october of 2019 there was a study done by business solver and they actually interviewed a thousand employees and 93% of them said that if they perceived their employer and their CEO as being empathetic, then they would stay with that company longer. So the direct effect on retention is significant. Secondly, they talked to the actual CEOs and said, asked about the correlation between empathy and financial performance. 91% of the CEOs said that they truly believed that empathy affected the financial performance of a company. And then last but not least, almost 80% of the employees surveyed said that they would have the willingness and they don't mind putting in extra hours on a project if they perceive their boss or their CEO or the culture at work to be empathetic. So these again are so important numbers. And if we can work to train leaders on how to be empathetic in and out of global pandemic world, but how to be empathetic It's gonna have a true effect on teams, on culture, and most importantly, on just having a healthy day-to-day life and not leaving part of yourself at the door. So when we look at empathy, how do you put it in place? And one of the ways you put it in place is how do you talk about it when someone comes back to work? So Minnie's gonna take us to opportunities for healing. Thanks, Lisa. I cannot watch that Renee Brown video enough. Every time I see it, I love it. And it just reminds me of what we do need um, really throughout our entire lives. We need to have people around us who um, have the capacity to show us empathy. And then we need to be able to find a place where we can also show show empathy for people. So opportunities for healing. So in in our work, an opportunity for healing comes in several different um, forms and and the one form that we were gonna talk about today is called an able conversation. So it's, it's a conversation. Conversations are difficult to have, but the importance of the conversation, um, just I, I just can't emphasize it enough. When my example is that when I returned to the office after a very significant life disruption, 
my office um, team knew my dad and my son and had known them, my son, almost his entire life. Some of them had known him his entire life. And conversations were extremely difficult because everyone was sad. So as an employer, a leader, um, a manager, it, it really does depend on what type of disruption happened to our employee that we're talking to. So you need to you know, use your, your brain about what type of disruption happened to them. Was it um, a death of a family member or um, was it a miscarriage, which is a death of a family member? Uh, was, is, is my employee moving one parent um, from a place to another? You know, maybe they're relocating. Or is there a child in the family that has an addiction? You know, it really does depend on what that is. But no matter what it is, a conversation needs to take place. And many times we don't want to have a conversation with someone. Uh, we don't want to feel those feelings that they're feeling. And we might say the wrong thing. We worry very much about saying the wrong thing. And here are the top 10 worst things that you can say. So we're just gonna talk about that for just a brief moment. I want you to take a look at this slide and take a look at those. I want to want you to know, I've said these before. I've said them to other people before my own life disruption, and I have said them after. I will tell you, I have never said after my life disruption that there is a reason for everything. Um, so please, I know a lot of people say that, and um, just when it comes to someone losing a uh, family member or a dear friend, uh, you know that's not a good one to use now. So just make sure that that's on your no list. So I don't want to leave you with the worst things and have you keep that in your mind the whole way. What's important is that you see the top 10 best things to say. And uh, in, in our chat, if you'll take a look at your chat, we're going to upload what we call our takeaway card. And if you, if you were in person with us or, or we had printed it for you, it's a nice little business size card that you can take with you. because. Chances are you might not need these um, top 10 best things to either say or do right this very minute. But when you do need them or you know um, someone's going to be in your midst at some point and you want to know what is the right thing to say, what is a good thing to say, we put them on a card. So you'll be able to, um, thank you, Mona, we'll be able to, you can print that card and have that with you. And, um, and hopefully one day we'll be able to get you the, the actual card that you can put in your wallet. So these are all good things to say and, and, or do. And I want you to notice number 10 is actually say nothing, just be with a person. So interestingly enough, I'm going to talk about a conversation and the conversation again is called an ABLE conversation. And we created an acronym on purpose to make it easier. I love acronyms, it makes it easier for me to remember things and, and understand my next steps. So, I just said you could be with someone and say nothing. When you start to have an able conversation with a, a disrupted employee, someone who's had something happen to them, they may not be able to talk to you yet. So your able conversation may last four minutes or three minutes. But the importance is, the important part is that you're reaching out to them. So I'm gonna go back to the fact that in, in standard operating procedures in our workforce, we tend to want to hand someone a card to um, an EAP or maybe we're the boss and, and manager and we want to just hand them the card to the human resources person and we, put, and we put them in their office and we just say, okay, go get better and come back when you're 100% when you're because I want you to be 100%. Well, of course you do as the employer. You want your people to be able to come back but we feel like that it's a responsibility of ours that if we want return on investment, we also want to emphasize return on human capital. We want to help those people come back in. So let's dive into what is an ABLE conversation. And you can see the acronym is laid out for you right here. So there's ask, believe, listen, and encourage. And I'll give you an example of each. What I want you to do is think about your disruption that you might have thought about earlier, okay? And think about it maybe either in your terms or someone else had it. But in our sake, our employee right now has just had a death in the family. And our leader, our employer, is about to have a conversation with this person. And what we want our leader to do is we want them to ask questions. You know, as an employer, you do need to know when will they come back. You do need to know um, what is their capacity. And those are things that we want you to ask, but those aren't really the first questions to ask. The first questions to ask are a little bit more succinct in about their personal life. 
there's something that you can ask them um, if there's funeral planning going on or um, if they're eating healthy food right now. I will tell you that when someone is in crisis, and we've heard a lot of jokes about this during COVID, but when someone is in crisis, they're either a starver or they eat too much. And neither of those are healthy, you know, on either spectrum. And so we wanna ask questions about our employee to let them know that we care about them. You know, how are your children? Um, can, you know, what can we do for your children right now? Help get them talking if they can talk. Again, it may be that the, it's a three minute or four minute conversation and it's really not talking. It may be that you're sitting and they're crying, but you've reached out and you've let them know that you care. So if you do ask these personal questions, I do want you to move on to being able to ask, um, what is your capacity right now? It's, it's a difficult question when you ask someone in a life disrupted situation, how are you? That's very broad. You wanna bring it down to, how are you in this five minutes? How are you feeling right this second? You know, et cetera. You don't wanna give them a lot of um, leeway because that is so broad when their brain is foggy and they have chaos going on in their personal lives. So you ask some questions with an empathetic uh, ear to listen. Um, before that, I want you to believe them. So believe is there for several different reasons, but the main reason is we don't want anyone to have judgment when someone answers a question for you. So if you ask the question, are you getting any sleep? How is your sleep? Uh, you know, have you, have you been able to get sleep since the funeral? Or have you been able to get sleep since, et cetera? And they answer you honestly that they're not getting much sleep. And maybe at this time in their life, they literally say to you, I think an angel appeared last night, or I'm not getting sleep because I'm having these nightmares and they keep waking me up. We want you to believe and believe without judgment right at that very moment, because you don't know what's going on in their mind and in their, their heart and soul. And, and again, what has happened to them. If they have a child that is addicted and they're in the throes of trying to figure out this new world of trying to save their child from that, they might be having some you know, crazy thoughts going on. So give them an opportunity to answer some questions and then you believe them. Then we'll move on to listen. So we have two ears and one mouth and I know all of you know why, because listening is more important than talking. So really with empathetic ears, be sure and listen to what they have to say because your job is to find out how you can help them ease back into uh, working again, okay, ease back into projects that they have, etc. And the more you listen, the more you are going to be able to help your team and this uh, disrupted employee reintegrate with one another. E is encouraged because after you've asked, believed, and listened, now you're going to have some resources. And if you personally don't know exactly where to send them or what to do, um, your human resources person might be able to help and or the EAP. The fact of the matter is we think it's highly crucial that you engage this employee, any employee that is disrupted, very quickly. You don't want to ignore them for a period of time thinking that you're giving them space or giving them time. What you're doing is you're allowing a wall to be built between you and them and they're thinking, does she not even know that I had something happen? Does she not realize what's going on? And you want to let them know that you actually do realize very much what's going on. So that's the importance of the, um, the ABLE conversation. And as you're encouraging, you can encourage your employee to get good sleep, uh, get some exercise, maybe get the right food on their table. And then you're also going to be at some point encouraging them to look at purpose. And Lisa's gonna talk about the importance of personalized purpose in our workplace. Thank you, Mindy. So when we encourage that employee, it probably won't happen immediately. It's gonna be over time. But more often than not, when someone has a life disruption, they are looking for purpose and they are looking for meaning. I mean, a perfect example, Mindy started the Faith Always Wins Foundation. I wrote a book after my mother passed away. We were looking for ways to redefine our purpose. And purpose is interesting because if you're familiar with the um, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and the cycles of grief, she, uh, it's not a linear process, as you know, it's very peaks and valleys and up and down, but there's a recent book that's been out, David Kessler, who's an author and a grief specialist, grief support specialist. He just wrote a book called Finding Meaning, The Sixth Stage of Grief. 
And when some com someone comes back to work and they've had something major happen in their life, maybe a death of a loved one, um, they are looking for that meaning and they are looking for that purpose. And what we don't want to have happen is we don't want to have that person leave our team and leave our company. We want to be able to help them with their purpose and their meaning during the workday. There's another uh, piece of work that I'm very familiar with and my work with people who have been grieving and it's called post-traumatic growth. And there's a professor from the University of North Carolina, Dr. Richard Tedeschi, and he has done a multitude of studies helping determine how people find growth after a life disruption, how people find a new path. Again, not leaving their, their day jobs, if you will, but finding meaning during the day and after work. Now this slide you'll see is the impact of purpose and these are among non-grievers. So the impact of purpose and meaning among non-grievers is, is very significant. Another uh, key point I'd like to share is that every year, uh, the Society of Industrial Psychologists puts together workplace trends for the coming year. And last December, uh, they have top 10 workplace trends. And for the first time ever, meaning and purpose ranked number eight in terms of top top workplace trends for 2020. And that is among people, has nothing to do with life disruptions. People are looking for ways to find work that matters and find a way to have meaning during the workday. And when we do our full workshops, one of the things we also um, share is specifically is helping people just take a few minutes um, in our workshops, maybe three or four minutes to actually think about what matters most to you. Uh, what are your values? What are you passionate about? Um, and that helps people kind of think about their purpose more. Just anecdotally, um, we've had some people tell us that they believe that part of their purpose at work was to be able to serve veterans. And so when they went back to the workplace, they developed some new initiatives on serving veterans in their workplace. So again, if we take the time to stop and maybe this is part of our global pause that we're all in right now. But if we take the time to stop, we can give some more thought to meaning and purpose and what might impact us during the workday. But as leaders, it is absolutely crucial that you understand that when an employee comes back to work, we've got to recognize this desire for purpose, this desire for meaning, and also recognize that with younger generations coming up in the workforce, meaning and purpose is incredibly important and has a significant effect on recruitment, on HR practices, and retention. So purpose is our third training module, and then we go into employee, employer engagement as our fourth training module. Mindy? Thank you, Lisa. Okay, so we're on E right now, and uh, it's important that I tie uh, employer, employee, employee, employer engagement back to the ABLE conversations. So you've had these authentic conversations. Um, you have them with empathy. You have them with awareness. And once you've done that, now you're able to, in E, when it's time to really re-engage them, and you know they're coming back into the, into the workspace, or, or the disruption itself is, um, might, if it's ongoing, and, but you need to reach out to them, okay? And you want to do something on behalf of them. So that's where this engagement comes from. So let me remind you, if you are in um, or have ever been involved in any kind of organization, a, a school, uh, a big company, a small company, anything where there are people gathered, et cetera. I mean, even if you are in the movie theaters now, not that we're in them today, but if you're in the movie theaters, there are now um, rules and regulations about how to disperse in the event there's a disaster. And so at work, those are called disaster recovery plans. And at my past employment, we had a disaster recovery plan. And it was a book about this thick with everything that needed to happen if something such and such happened. So it was this you know, um, process of if uh, the office is flooded, this is what's happened. If there's a tornado, this is what's happened. This is what we do, et cetera. You know, what do we do with the computer system? I mean, it's so detailed about how to survive a disaster. What we are lacking in our corporate culture is having a human recovery plan. And um, again, we love the opportunity for someone to use an employee assistance provider 
Um, we just want the employer to be more involved with our employee that we're talking about. And, um, and so let's talk about what a human recovery plan is for. Again, when someone has a life disruption, they're going to be a foggy brain at some level. They're going to have some chaos potentially going on in their personal lives. And so now you know they're coming back into your workspace, but we want you to help them do that. We want you to have those able conversations, again, authentic conversations, not just one, but it's plural. And then we want you, if you're the employer or the HR manager, um, the leader of the company, we want you to engage maybe the team around this person. If it's a, a, a big enough company, even if it's four to 12 people, and you can engage other people to help with this plan, you actually put a plan in place, a logistic plan. And what this does is it shares with not only the employee who is currently in this life disruption, you're also sharing with all of your other employees that you care about them and that this might have, if something happens in their life, that their team is going to be surrounding them as well. The human recovery plan is a practical tool that allows for head and heart based healing to come together. So let me give you some examples of a plan. Well, first of all, you know what I'm going to say. Day one or uh, day zero, you want to have an able conversation and, and find some discovery. It's, it's like being a triage nurse when you have an able conversation. What, what's going on and, and what can I get to know about um, my employee? And then maybe full day one or day two, what you want to do is maybe offer a meal for your team or a meal in the office or a meal at home for this disrupted person. Let them know that you care about them with food. We all love to meet around a table of food. And so food is always good to work in um, a five day plan and you can even work it in twice. Um, I'm gonna do a poll in just a minute, but I'm gonna let you know, I'm gonna give you a couple of thoughts on that. And then I want you to answer this poll and give some um, ideas. We gave some ideas to you and we wanna know if you've had them happen for you. Let me give you another idea. So when we weren't in COVID, one of our thoughts was to have a chair massage. Now, having a chair massage or something available for a team or a life disrupted person and their team is awesome. But right now, what could you do? You could maybe get a gift card for that person and let them know that you care about them. You can also send a card. Uh, you can send an e-card. You can send a real card. Things that are important to remember in a human recovery plan are that they don't have to be a start on day one and a finish on day five. They could be once a week for six weeks, someone from your team does one thing for this person. So let them know that they are cared about. Um, also during the um, human recovery plan, you're engaging everyone. So it's not just the leader, it's everyone being able to help this person return. One of our best examples, I'm gonna launch this poll. Sorry, I forgot, I'm in charge of the polls. Uh, one of our examples of a friend who, there we go, re-engaged, she had a significant life disruption and she was re-engaging and her human resources director did a fantastic job of calling her many, many times before she came back into the office. And then about um, three or four days before she returned to the office, uh, the HR person asked the employee, she said, how do you want to be received? Do you want there to be some fanfare? Do you want to have something big or do you want to come in quiet? This life disrupted person is a very good friend of mine and she had already been in the news, uh, national and regional news, international news, and she didn't want a lot of fanfare. But what's important is her HR director called and asked her the question, how do you want to come back in? So what her team did is her team decorated her cubicle. It was a quiet return back into the office, but they decorated her cubicle with pictures of, um, of, of my friend and her husband, and they put really encouraging words up. They put words up that said, we believe and have faith and we love you. And it was just really endearing. And she said she felt like they really did care about her. So um, we have quite a few votes here. I'm gonna go ahead and end the polling and share it so you all can see as well. Um, so acknowledging, I'm not gonna read them all to you, but you can see acknowledgement of my disruption is high, which is great. Um, personal note of support, good. A meal, often, yes, Kleenex. Sometimes in our ABLE conversations, just a, a, a Kleenex is definitely needed. Um, and then assistance with project management. Here's where I wanna focus on that for just a second. When you're in an ABLE conversation, um, once you ask some personal questions, you absolutely wanna move on to work, work questions. And one of those questions is, 
you know, what were you working on last and how can we help you? How can your team help you? There's so many different questions that you can ask and then you can listen. And then after you've done the ABLE conversations, you can build this human recovery plan. When workplace healing gets hired, we go in and work with the CEOs and the leadership. Everyone heals differently. Everyone processes grief differently. And companies all have their own cultures. So what's important on our point of view is to work directly with a, a company or our client and discuss with them what is best for them. And then what do they think is best for that person in particular? So that was great. That was really fantastic participation. Thank you all for doing that. So that is how to have and build a human recovery plan. When it is a death, we do recommend that you kind of do a little bit more intensity and you focus on um, going on beyond maybe a five day or a 10 day. Again, not every day in a row is absolutely needed. But another thing is remember people on holidays. We just had Memorial Day. And if you've lost a family member or a dear loved one and you used to spend holidays with them and they were part of what you did, holidays are really hard. And frequently, we're not together with our work, work team on holidays. And so what's good is for the team to remember, hey, uh, July 4th is coming up. That's our, our next holiday. July 4th is coming up. Uh, Susie lost her husband. Let's remember Susie on July 4th. You know, does anyone want to invite Susie over on July 4th? Or what can we do to make sure that, that Susie doesn't have a completely miserable July 4th weekend and then come back into work really miserable again? So as, as a work family, you're trying to remember and engage how to keep that person, you know, um, engaged with you and know that you authentically care about them because you're using your empathy, your new empathy skills. So that's our employee-employer engagement. And, um, and now we're going to end. Lisa's going to give us a uh, wrap-up. Thank you, Mindy. So this is what we believe hope can look like in corporate America. And the four components, again, heart-based healing, which is the combination of inner and outer awareness, which we call whole self-awareness, leading us to empathy so that we can be an empathetic leader with all our employees and when they're coming back to work and even now, of course, during COVID-19. Secondly, we've given you some practical tools on what to say and what not to say and how to have an ABLE conversation. Uh, we're finding that people are telling us that ABLE conversations are working for their families. So it's not even just, you know, employees right now. It's, it's really a way to, to have an empathetic conversation. Three, we hope you've learned that purpose is so very crucial. Uh, for people who have experienced a loss or experienced any sort of life disruption. And as employers, it's important for us to look at our uh, cultural missions, our objectives, what's happening already at our company. Maybe we could uh, develop a, an Alzheimer's walk, for example, if we're trying to support an employee who maybe has lost a parent to that disease. So what can we look at in our corporations and in our teams to help that person find meaning and help that person find purpose. And then for those um, employees that are even not affected by a life disruption, remember that it is very important to uh, remember that, that work matters and meaning matters, especially for the younger generations coming up on their career tracks. And then engagement, the practical best practices on how we can develop a plan when we, our employee comes back to work, as Mindy walked through. So again, this is what we believe hope looks like, and our mission is to change corporate culture and to help corporate cultures find the balance of head and heart in the workplace. Right now, we're booking our workshops for fourth quarter, and we'd love to have you uh, be a partner with us. So we encourage you to reach out. You'll see on this final slide here our website, our social media channels. Uh, feel free to contact uh, Mindy or myself with any questions. And we hope that we've given you some great things to think about today. And then now we're going to take a peek at the chat and see what kind of questions you might have. Thank you so much. Yes, if you have any questions, you can put them in chat. Um, it is a small group, so I'm going to open up just on my screen. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing. And that way we can open up the screen. And if you want, we are small. So if you want to talk to us, just um, unmute yourself and raise your hand and we can call on you or you can put something in 
I see that Donna Gordon mentioned that you're self-employed and you haven't had an employer for 20 years. And so um, you haven't had an employer pampering you um, when you needed some pampering. So I hope, Donna, that your, um, that your friend tribe or your clients, I hope that whoever you work with, I hope that they helped you um, if you've had a life disruption as well. We can all do that in, in any facet of our lives. I have a question. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so I, for an, a life disruption that's not like your obvious one that people would normally talk about, like a death in the family, but let's say their spouse lost a job or something, that can be pretty devastating. I mean, how do, how do you help employers either recognize that or how do you help them talk to their employees to say, come forward? Because, you know, we're, I mean, because that's, I, you know, just how do you help them when it's kind of the silent kind of disruption? Yes, thanks, Renee. That's a good question. So I think, can you all hear thunder? I have a storm right over my head all of a sudden. Okay, so that's what okay. we did. Um, so what I would recommend is as an employer, um, they, if they see that the employee is not functioning as well. So that's how they're going to notice. I mean, if the employee chooses to not share, um, I actually talked with a, a new friend of mine about three weeks ago and, and I was sharing what we were doing with him. And he said, well, when I decided, when we were going through our divorce, he said, I said to my boss, you know, I'm not gonna be performing as well. And I'm, I'm gonna be doing this, but I'm letting you know, but I don't need anything from you. So he kind of spouted all this stuff off to his employer. And I said, well, did your employer respond like maybe three or four days later just to even check in on you? And he said, no. And I said, would it have helped? And he said, yes, it would have helped. So I think if an employer, first of all, becomes aware of product productivity, you know, or, you know, attitude. I mean, you know, if you know your team members well, I think that you will notice something like that. And then I think that's a private conversation. That's an able conversation to ask some questions around that. And of course, you've got to know your team members. And if you don't know them very well, then start having able conversations just to get to know them. You know, mm -hmm. just before a life disruption happens, just have able conversations. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love to share one of the things I learned from Mindy and Lisa at the live uh, workshop they did at Central Exchange, whenever that was, a year or so ago. You know, we we all want to do something. And I noticed that even in the survey giving or offering food, you know, taking food somewhere is so popular. But what you, one of the things you helped me understand is it's, it's one thing to say, hey, can I bring over dinner? But it's another thing to say, hey, I'd love to make a pan of whatever, whatever, chicken piccata. Do you have any food allergies? And would tonight be better or should I bring it over on Sunday? Exactly. That's, that's a great point, Mona. And you know, it's interesting because sometimes we want to help. And one of the natural responses is to say, well, let me know what I can do. And that's not really helpful to somebody. They need to know that, okay, I'm going to bring something over on Thursday and they, you know, you, they've got three kids and there's a peanut allergy or whatever the case may be. So I think being specific is, is the only way to go. And along those lines, and we didn't mention this today, but sometimes when a leader says, take as long as you need and come back, um, that's really not a helpful thing to say either. And we do it because we want to help and we want to make them feel cared for and cared for by the team. But when we say to somebody, take as long as you need, it can be super overwhelming uh, to somebody who's trying to balance whatever life disruption they've got going on. It's, it's better to have that able conversation and specifically talk about timeframes. Because grief, as you know, it's an it's, uh, individual journey. You know, it's, it's different for everybody and it goes in peaks and valleys and really any kind of grief, not just the death of a loved one. So thanks for asking that. Let's see, we've got a couple of Jennifer Levinson um, asked about self-care, uh, especially when you're self-employed. And Mindy and I can, can both jump in on this one because we both work from our homes. So, you know, we're kind of the lone uh, workers in our home fronts. And I think, you know, it's interesting. We have to establish boundaries and, and be able to um, say, okay, I'm going to go for a walk or I'm going to go uh, be out in nature for a while and, and be able to balance because I think that's really important. And I just anecdotally talking to so many people who are, you know, everybody's working from home right now, even if you're in a big corporation, but 
it seems like people are even putting in more hours now than they did before because they're home all the time. You know, they're not rushing out to meetings or, or driving downtown to Central Exchange even. So, you know, what can we do in terms of self-care? I just think it's so important. And the big thing on that is what is important to you, you know, and what brings you joy and then finding ways to bring that into your day is just so important. Um, I think that uh, one of the benefits, if we will, and the, you know, instead of going back to normal, I keep like, I keep telling myself it's going to be back to better, you know, after our COVID-19 is over or somehow over, but what, what does back to better mean? And hopefully it'll mean, like Jennifer says, it'll mean more self-care and recognizing our priorities and what's important to us. So that's a great point. Yes. And I had written back to Jennifer and just asked about, you know, who is in your tribe? And uh -huh. um, certainly there's, there's, Lisa did a great job on self-care, going for a walk, getting out in nature is huge. Um, I had a girlfriend call me last night, completely distressed. And I said, uh, I'm going to walk outside. I want you to as well. And I went for a walk with her, but I was in another state than she was. And we uh -huh. just walked together for about 15 minutes while we talked. Um, ask, 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 you know, when we know, if we know that we need care, uh, I, you know, we need to we need to make the ask of our of who is in our tribe, and then um, Katie asked the question, and I, in terms of the chat using the chat, when I responded, I don't know how it comes across. I went ahead and put it in twice, but I answered Jennifer, and then it shows that I answered Katie in the same paragraph. So Katie had asked the question about helping someone who's far away. Um, I'm a master at at doing an e-card. Or, or finding a local flower shop to send something, uh, or you know, finding something and, and deliver it, having it delivered to them. So you can always reach out to them, and then you can also have a Zoom call with them. And Mona, I wanted to address what you said about narrowing things down and being personalized. When you are asking questions in an able conversation, um, the, the broader, the harder it is for someone who is really foggy brain to answer. So you need to be super, super specific. So if you want to ask the question, how are you, which we all want to say, we all want to say, well, how are you? If you really want to say, how are you right this very second? Like, are you hungry right this second? Are you thirsty right this second? Um, one of the best work questions to ask when you get to work questions is how is your capacity? And can we talk about projects, you know? And if they say no, you can say, um, you know, let's meet uh, tomorrow and have another conversation. And so, you know, the able conversations are meant to be um, plentiful and not just one at a time. <laughs> okay, so Liz asked, once training is completed and your staff understand the hub concept, how would you suggest that the concept becomes part of the culture of the organization? Liz, I would recommend that it becomes part of the onboarding process. If, um, if it's something that the company has, you know, whether it's turnover or not, but they're hiring new people, I would have it as part of the uh, onboarding process. And then um, perhaps you have a conversation about the um, human recovery plan or maybe what the team's human recovery plan looks like. Uh, maybe once a quarter, there's just a conversation about it before there's a life disruption. So when things right. are calm, when things are calm, that's a great time to have that conversation. Uh, you know, when people start a company, they write an operating agreement when th they like each other and everything's going well. And uh, when people are about to get married and they need a prenuptial agreement, you write that before everything's, you know, you write it when you still love each other and like each other and want to get married. So those types of things are all good to do. But frequently, what, when we started um, putting this company together, I mean, it was because things kept happening to people, to me and then to people that I knew and people that they weren't being reintegrated well and so we would like to get in front of people uh, ahead of time and so yeah i think it, it becomes part of your culture mm -hmm. that looks like that's it mona i think we're good if anybody wants to email us you know separately if you have a question thank you all for joining we appreciate it very much thank you so much and don't hesitate to reach out to us so Mindy and Lisa, thank you both so much. For everybody that's on the call, just a reminder that you're going to be getting an email later this afternoon with the link to this webinar so that you can share that, share it, watch it again. Also some short questions 
because uh, we want to make sure that we're continuing to serve the Central Exchange members and our guests. And we had many guests on today. And we're grateful that you are here. So again, thank you all for being here. Great conversation. Love you guys and uh, continue doing the work that you do. We appreciate you very much. Thanks, Mona, for having us. Thank you. Bye, all. <clears throat>